My guest today is Chris Woodruff. Chris, how are you? Good, Dave. How about you? I'm doing great. Welcome back to the show. It's been a while. It's been a while, but you've been on, a I think, years. more than anybody else. Um, I think. I have to verify that. Is that is that a good thing? or? That's a very no, good thing. Good, good for me. It's good for my I'm audience. you infamous, right? You're infamous because of the literally tens of viewers that are watching tens, this. Dozens of viewers? <laughs> yeah. No, it's got a good following. So, um, let's talk about HTTP because I know you did a talk today at VS Live on the topic. Yeah, so most people think it's not a very exciting topic, but well, I, I, I'm going to differ with you. I, everybody knows it's important, right? Because yes. we use it all the time. Yes. Is that what you mean? Because they think well, it's mundane because it's, it's so common. It, yeah, it's it's one of those things that everyone's heard of and everyone has an inkling of what it is, but no one. Most people don't really understand the language, what I call the language of HTTP. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. So that's what, that's what we're here for. You're going to teach us. They don't understand what it can give, um, especially I, I talk about HTTP and then go into REST. Okay. And people don't really understand how to fully utilize HTTP for their REST APIs. Okay, and, let's, let's you mentioned a couple APIs. of things here. Let's, let's get okay. some definitions. HTTP okay. is what? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Okay, transport, I think, but I'm could Transport, be wrong. yes. And so and What does that mean, though? Well, HTTP is the language that every everything communicates on the internet. Okay. So when I call something, so I'm in Chrome or Edge browser, and mm -hmm. I go out to CNN.com. Mm -hmm. That call is made up of a header and a body. So that is an HTTP request. Yes. And that holds information to be sent across the internet, across the wire, mm -hmm. to a server, which will take that and um, decode it. Mm -hmm and then figure out what the caller wants, what's, what the requester wants, and gather up the, that resource and get the resource and send it back in a response, uh, uh, in a HTTP response. Okay, so HTTP is defining that request and a corresponding yes. response. Yes. And how that should be constructed, how it should be sent and received yeah. and all that stuff. Very cool, and then what is REST? So REST is um, a idea that Roy Felding wrote up in a dissertation, in his PhD dissertation at University of Texas. And his dissertation is quite large, and REST was just a small part of it. And it's this idea that you can leverage HTTP and the way that the internet was created to to architect your web applications. Mm -hmm. So so in my talk I have I have two different directions that you can architect new solutions from from scratch. Okay. You can either just stand up everything on your own and create everything on your own and create your own ideas or you can leverage the constraints of the environment that you're working in. And so that's really what REST is. It's, it's saying, let's use what HTTP does to build a better mousetrap, so to say, for okay. the internet. And this is the case, a mousetrap is a way of creating uh, APIs, uh, yeah. functions that you can call yeah. that will do something. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So uh, what, uh, now you, you, your talk was really some of the fundamentals of HTTP that people are missing. What are the important things that I, as a software developer, should know yeah. about HTTP that maybe I don't? So you should fully understand the verbs and what the verbs mean. Okay. Um, Is there always a verb with every HTTP request? Yes. So everything has to have a verb. Mm -hmm. Everything has to have a verb, a resource, and what we call CR URI, a universal resource identifier. Okay. And some people think of it as URL, but there's a URL and URI in most conversations are almost the same. So I, I always say URI okay. with with that. So so think of it as a sentence. So a sentence has to have a noun and a verb 
basic and then you can have other things that go along with it. Agreed. HTTP has to have a verb that works on a resource, which is kind of like a noun. Okay. And then we have some other things that go along with it. Okay, so the resource might be like a, a web page that I'm requesting. Could. Or an image, or, an image. or okay. a PDF. And what, give me an example of verbs. So there's this, the one that most people know, the four are get, post, put, and delete. Hmm. Uh, get is where I want to get a resource from some place that is outside of my um, machine. So I call that, and and we treat it like a client server type of okay. type of environment. So my machine, I am the client, and I'm calling a server to give me back a resource. Okay. So if I click a hyperlink on a web page, for example, they would send a GET request, yep. and it would return yeah. probably some other web, yeah. some so, new web page. So every every um, hyperlink that that we have corresponds to a resource that can be that can be located you uniquely okay so think of that as every resource on the internet is unique because of the resource and the location where it's at and that right. that makes up a, a URL or a web link okay and then what do these other ones do the the put and the, yeah the so and post Post. post, you can think of post as it creates a new resource or it sends over information, new information across the wire. Hmm. And then put is, will update a resource. Hmm. And then delete is delete a resource. Okay. That's the most intuitive one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. And get, then there, maybe. there's other ones like head and option and trace and... Um, Tunnel and patch, patch, right. patch is another one, but um, there's some interesting ones. Like as an example, if you ever want to know if a resource exists, but you don't care if it gets if it comes back, okay, you can use head. Oh, I didn't know and, that. And what that will do is that will give you everything other than the resource coming back in the response body. Mm. So that way you can say, does this resource exist? Yes. There's no errors, so I can go get it. Oh, so maybe if it's a very large file, for example, it would take too long to get it. You might just want to just check to see if it's yeah. there or not. Okay. Yeah. And then option. Option, everyone sees options a lot with uh, web APIs, especially when they're using cores. Cores is? Oh, what does cores stand for? <laughs> I don't know what it stands for. Has, it has to do with cross-site scripting. Yeah, cross-site scripting. So it's permission to yeah. run uh, code that will access some exactly. resource out of the domain of the page that you're running on. Yes. I hope I've got that right. Yeah, so a lot of times you'll see when you're working with uh, APIs that have cores set up and you're calling it from, from another uh, domain, right. you'll see that you'll get, before you can do a get or a post or a put or a delete, you will see that this option gets called and comes back and gets validated. And that is to make sure that the call for the resource for the verb that you want is valid. Oh, okay. And so you'll send out this option and it'll come back and say, yep, all's good or nope, you can't do it. And if it's you can't do it, then then that means that you can't it's kind of hard to explain. You can't, you from where you are, you can't get to that API. Okay, right, I understand. Um, and it's mostly a JavaScript. That's, so this is a yes. big issue. Is it, uh, there's a big issue with cross-site scripting that allows yeah with security that's, you know, without course. Then you could write a web page that <laughs> has some JavaScript that would run on one web page and access some secure information somewhere else. And yes. this is to prevent that. Yes. All right. Um, so uh, how do I use this information then when I'm building my APIs? Yeah, so, so let's also talk about uh, HTTP response codes. Oh, because yeah. they're, they're the other part of this, of this equation, this, this language. Yeah. So when we call a, when we send out an HTTP request, we expect the response to come back. And that response needs to have some kind of indicator as to the the condition of that response. So did it fail? Did it succeed? 
is there any other steps that I have to do? Uh, was it if it failed? Is it my mistake? Is it something on the server's right. uh, side that that failed? So that's where these response codes come in, hmm. and they cover a wide gambit of conditions. And they're broken down into five areas. So we have the 100s, the 200s, the 300s, and the 400s. Hmm. The 100s and the 300s don't really get used very often, um, but it's the 200s, which are success and different types of success okay. that are used a lot, uh, 400s, our uh, failure, the user or the client has some kind of failure. Maybe they didn't set up uh, the URL right or they gave up a, uh, a URI that didn't go to a valid resource mm, okay. or they're not authenticated to get to the resource. And then 500 is some type of s server error happened. Okay. All right, so if I'm writing uh, either, uh, I'm writing an API, yeah, I, I want to check to make sure that I get a response back that's somewhere between 200 and 299 because yeah. those are all the good ones. Yes. Um, if anything between 400 or above, 400 yeah. something or 500 something, that means there's a problem. There's a problem somewhere. All right. And, and why we do this is when I call an API, I need to know when I get back what, that, what the response really meant. And it's, it's kind of like if I asked you, uh, how do I go to XYZ, and you tell me directions. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like that. So I can come back and, and say a 204. If I delete a resource, mm -hmm. if I say I want this image deleted on this server, and it comes back with a 204, what's that mean? I don't know. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's, it was successful, but there's no content returned in the HTTP response body. Oh, I see. Yeah, because why would you want something come to come back from a delete? Okay. It's like, I'm wanting it to be deleted. Now, for a get, I don't want a 204 to be used because a get, I want that resource to come back in the, in the response body. So for that, I want a 200. Okay, now you're rattling these off because you've worked with HTTP a lot. Uh, but I, I certainly know how these codes. I knew 200, but yeah, there's a lot of codes I haven't memorized. There are, and, and for most people, it's, I mean, there's lots of web pages that they can look up. Uh, it's funny. There's there's even some uh, dog. There's some images, some memes okay. that uh, someone created. All these dog representations of HTTP response codes. Oh, really? So yeah. like a deleted dog, for example? <laughs> yeah, like deleted dog or dogs in teapots. So there's a- yeah, Tell me about a, the teapot response. Yeah, so this, this goes back to the 90s, and I don't know the full story, but there was someone, some, some of the people in the, that created, that started out and, and worked on the first version of HTTP, there must have been a joke going around about someone, and and there was something about that someone was a teapot, or I don't know the full story, but there's a response code. <laughs> I'm a little code. teapot, short and stout. Stout, yeah. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. And so 418. I don't know why that number that number was selected, but 4 418 is I'm a teapot response <laughs> code. Uh, so if you definitely want to return that information to your users, to your clients. <laughs> I don't really know the condition to return that, but I think it was just set up as a inside like an Easter egg. Yeah, I think it was an April Fool's joke is what I've read. Yeah, I, I don't know the something backstory. like that. But no one uses it, but it's it's a valid, <laughs> documented uh, response code. Oh, who you say valid and document? Who is doing the validation? Who who decides that? 204 is deleting and 200 is okay. And yeah, it, it comes from probably the W3C. Okay. The worldwide, worldwide web um, consortium. Consortium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think they and the people that work on the HTTP spec. Okay. There's a committee that that oversees it. I think that when they have a suggestion from someone. Um, to, to create a new response code, they probably take it under advisement and debate mm -hmm. and, 
and say yes or no at the end and right. and make it official. These are the same people that are deciding what are valid HTML tags and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I assume they're in some uh, giant tower somewhere. In White the, tower in with the middle, big beards. Big beards and hoods over there. <laughs> yeah. Over yeah. their faces. You, yeah, they could. <laughs> they could. That's the image I have of yeah. these guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, excellent. Anything else we should uh, that was useful for? Um, let's de see. Web developers. Well, um, so there are. I mean, REST has a lot of different constraints, and I won't go into a lot of them. But there are things like the constraints that Felding um, stated to be to adhere to a RESTful type of API is it should be client server, which is natural. Okay. Um, another big one that people don't think about is in, in this constraint is caching. Okay. So I've been burned by this in the past where we didn't think about caching up front and it's hard to build in caching when you already have kind of everything set hmm. it's kind of hard to wedge in that caching that so yeah. so one thing I always try to stress to to people is think about not only uh, caching in your server side solution if you're building something in in ASP.NET uh, core 2.1 web API or if you're building it in node think about caching at that level because you can save time if you bring the data and cache it closer to you from whatever data repository it's in. But think about the caching that HTTP also gives you on the client side. Mm -hmm. Because there is a way that your uh, web servers and your web APIs can uh, set different headers in your uh, response uh, in your HTTP response and say, this information, this resource, or these resources that are in my, they're in the HTTP response body can be cached. And mm -hmm. they can say how long that okay. data can be cached on the client side. Okay. And that can really save you a lot of uh, time and efficiency and performance in, okay. your, in your client side application. Okay, and so I think the, the point you've been making all along is that caching is an example of something that's built into HTTP itself. Yes. And so if we build a REST API, we don't have to roll our own caching. Well, we have, to, we have to implement the, the caching on the client side. All it's saying, HTTP is just a protocol. Okay. So it's not a technology. Okay. So how we implement that protocol is different. So, so Microsoft implemented HTTP in Windows, hmm. um, and the Linux people did it in Linux, and so everyone ha has to adhere to that protocol, but everyone's implementation is slightly different. Okay. So when, when I have a client-side application framework like .NET or let's say JavaScript mm -hmm. for Angular or React, and I get a HTTP response code that has a header in there that says that the information can be, the resource can be cached, I have to do that myself. I have mm -hmm. to figure out how to cache that. Now some browsers have it built in, but if I'm building JavaScript to, to ping an API, I have to, I have to either use, if there's some kind of library that will that will implement caching based on in that HTTP uh, response, okay. or maybe there's a NuGet package for C sharp. Okay. So or just find there's there's lots of different ways to do okay. it. Okay. I guess it's maybe just the transport that's really common that we don't have to uh, if we're implementing caching that communication mechanism say hey yes. we're, these are the objects we're going to cache telling your client about that that's something we don't have to reinvent exactly. as a spec. and then you you kind of touched on this you didn't say it explicitly but um, HTTP 
can be sent from a Windows machine and received from a Linux machine. Yep. And then without any problems at all because yep. it's a standard. Yep. And that's a glorious thing right there. I it think. is. And that was the backbone of the internet yeah. that, that we have all these protocols that, um, that allow different machines to communicate with each other. Kind of a hands across the water thing. I get, yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. Excellent. Uh, where can people go for more information to look, educate themselves about HTTP? Oh, there's tons of stuff out there. All you have to really do is uh, just do a search for like HTTP for API developers. Okay. Or so, I mean, um, I mean, I've got. I've got a uh, slide deck that I'll probably put out. Maybe we can put it in the show notes sure, where, where people can download my slide deck from. Yeah. Is it, from do today. you have a blog? I know you used to. I, I do have a blog. I, I haven't blogged out there for a while, okay. but maybe I'll, I'll blog a little bit about HTTP and REST. Yeah. But, uh, but I'll put the slide deck out on my blog and, okay. and I'll give you a link to it. Excellent. Chris, thanks so much. Thank you. We don't have to have HTTP to communicate about technology with friends. <laughs>